Hey y'all, Data Guy here. And today I have a video for you where I want to kind of extend some of my previous sort of told you, you know, how you can optimize things to show you some real world examples of how you can optimize your SQL queries. So building on kind of my basic guide to using SQL, this is for that next level where, hey, I'm using SQL, but now I'm working with large data sets. Now I'm working in more production settings where the speed and efficiency of those queries can become more and more, much more important. Um, so if anyone wants to work with big data, if you're trying to query millions, billions of rows, those queries aren't cheap. Um, they can add up really quickly. And then, you know, Snowflake's famous for saying, hey, end of the month, you run all these queries, now you're gonna be paying a big bill for it, right? So I'm going to show you how you can take some proactive strategies to make sure that your queries are written in a way uh, that is not going to cost you a lot of money for the actions that are performed. So eliminate all the waste, all the bloat from traditional query structures, and also show you how you can kind of optimize your data sets as well to work with those more uh, efficient queries to just keep that cost as low as humanly possible. So without further ado, let's get into it. So the first tip I have for you is a relatively simple one to implement, and that is to utilize proper indexing. So if I zoom in here a little bit, you can kind of think of indexes like the contents of a book, right? You have, they allow the database to quickly locate the data without scanning the contents of each page. They just know what page to look for and then to pull that page. So when a column is indexed, the database can then use that index to quickly find rows that match that query and reduce the amount of data that needs to be scanned, thus reducing your costs. And it's a pretty easy thing to implement. So let's say I wanted to create a new index called IDX users email on users email. What this would do is iterate through every email column or every entry that has an email uh, and give them an index. So first email is gonna be one, second email is gonna be two, third email is gonna be three, so on and so forth. So that instead of needing to query and ask for each email, you can just say, hey, look for this specific uh, index. So then when you want to go on and query the users table with the condition on the email column, the database is able to use that index to much more quickly locate those relevant rows. Now, the next tip I have for you is selecting only necessary columns. So here we have kind of two examples of queries that I'll, I'll get into in a second, but just to give you some high level kind of ideas, selecting all columns from users obviously is inefficient because you're selecting every single data point from every single row. Uh, and if a table has a ton of different columns and you have large data, you're select and you're selecting a lot of columns you don't need, you're gonna just be massively increasing your data IO and transfer costs without any real benefit. So always, instead of using select all from users, unless you truly do need every column, make sure you're just selecting the columns you need. It's the same kind of thing where, hey, you're still getting all the IDs, all the names, all the emails from these users, but maybe now you don't need to have their purchase history and the amount of logins they've had. Um, and so now you just have the columns you need and are able to reduce the amount of data processed and then transmit it afterwards. Now, the next tip I have for you is to use where clauses to filter data early before you query all the data and then filter it. So if you're applying filters in your query using this where clause, so where active equals true, that's gonna reduce the number of rows that need to be processed in those subsequent operations. So maybe you know that, hey, I'm going to eventually clear out inactive users from this data set. Why not do it at the, at the start? Instead of just using a select ID, you know, select statement, and then having another step that then cleans and purges that data, if you have a simple flag that you can use the where clause, where clause to say, hey, only take this set of uh, entries, it's going to minimize the workload on your database, speed up your query execution, and also make sure it costs much less. So in this situation, only active users will be processed further rather than all active and inactive users. Now, the next tip I have for you is to avoid complex joins and subqueries. And so what I mean by that is complex joins and subqueries can increase the computational load on a database because you know you, the more complexity you have in a single operation, more math the database has to do to figure it out, right? And so simplifying those operations and breaking them down into their more atomic components reduces the amount of processing required because the database is more easily able to say, all right, just selecting this from this, making a left join all as separate actions rather than all in the same action. And that reduces the need for the database to perform multiple queries uh, because you're just doing jo more efficient joins 
Um, and you know, if you don't have just one massive long string where selecting UID count from it's you know bracketed inside from users, you can see you almost have like three different queries condensed into one here, versus a more efficient manner where you have a you know first select this as order count, then from that get the users join orders and users on user ID and then group by ID and username. Much simpler and also much easier to follow if you're trying to go back and look at this query. So not only is it improving uh, efficiency, but it's also a much more visually understandable query uh, if you're someone that's coming in and trying to understand what a query does, you know, if you're new to the team. And of course, reduces the need for the database to run a subquery for every row within that user's table. Now, the next tip I have for you is using the exist operator. If you use the exist operator, or instead of the in operator in subqueries, you can reduce the kind of unnecessary searching uh, that the in uh, query will do because the exists operator stops searching once it finds a matching row. While in requires you search and create a full result set before filtering it to find that one particular uh, row that you need. So here in this example, as you can see, in our inefficient query, we're using where ID is in user ID from orders versus here, we're saying when where exists select one from orders where the user ID equals the orders user ID. So just that one query that, or just that one row that matches the user ID we've inserted. And what this will do is then the query is gonna short circuit as, and stop running as soon as it finds that matching row because it just needs to find one row. Versus the in query will keep searching, go through the entire table before they actually uh, stop searching and return that row which they're going to filter through all those rows and return you the one that actually matches there. Now, the next tip I have for you is to avoid using functions on index columns where you could, or in where clauses. So using functions on columns in the where clause can prevent the database from actually using the indexes that you have added because you followed that first tip because the function that needs to apply to every row negating the benefit of that index. So in this inefficient query, you're saying, hey, in select ID where the upper email is example domain. So in this case, it's saying uppercase to make sure, hey, uh, I know that all my databases are stored in uppercase um, and you know I, I want to use this uppercase example. So if an email isn't stored in all uppercase, make it that so that I can then test if it's uh, equal to my uppercase example email. Whereas a more efficient way to do this would just be to go, hey, search for this email, where that email is example domain. And this allows the index to, or the database to use the index on the email column to then find that. Versus because you have this upper wrapper around the email column here, it's not able to use that index to more easily find where that email is. Now, the next tip I have for you is to optimize your join operations. Efficient joins uh, ensure that your database can very quickly match rows between tables and proper indexing of join columns and using explicit join syntax helps the database optimize that join operation. So in this example, instead of just leveraging the actual raw, uh, you, you know, the, the raw rows, the raw information there, we're using the user IDs, um, we're using the indexes. And we're also using things like where clauses, we're using uh, on, join. And this assures that the join operation is performed efficiently by leveraging those indexes, by letting it use those indexes uh, that can make sure that, hey, don't need to query through everything, and I also don't need to query and retrieve the values of each email row or each user row. I just need to look at that ID row, and that is what I'm gonna use as my source of truth there. So really simple fix, but yeah, just making sure that, hey, you're implementing those, those indexes, make sure you're using them to make your uh, joins more efficient. Now, another uh, great tip is to use limit to restrict the number of rows that you're actually querying. So let's say you, know, you only need to subset a sample of rows if it is needed, then you can use limit to reduce the workload by limiting the number of rows processed and then returned by the query. And this can be particularly useful for paginated results. So if you know that, hey, this is gonna be multiple pages, this is going to be you know, tons of different rows, and I only need to get the first 10, instead of doing a you know, select all the IDs by order created at, and you know, then just saying, hey, I'm just gonna take the top 10 rows of that larger data set, just only get me 10, only give me those first 10 and reduce the number of rows that your database needs to sort and return. And this is you know, a relatively simple one that some people don't use because they're used to saying, hey, I'll just run this query and then you know, copy and paste a little preview uh, window that it gives me you know, when I'd run that query. 
you can run that much faster and much cheaper if you just only query for that window of the actual um, rows that you need to monitor. So next, I wanna go into kind of a little subcategory of database schema optimization. Uh, and the first thing I wanna talk about is creating a normalized schema. So normalization involves organizing your database to reduce redundancy, improve data integrity, and by eliminating duplicate data, this is a really easy way to quickly reduce the size of your database and improve performance for certain types of queries. So in this example, this is a structure of a normalized schema where this structure ensures that user information is stored only once and reduces any kind of redundancy because you have this foreign key user ID references user ID. So you have a table of users and then each user has a separate table of, or there's a separate table of orders that is linked to these user IDs. Um, and number one, this means that when you're, you know, if you want, just want to query users or you just want to query orders, you don't need to query all the users or you don't need to query all the orders to get the regular information. And you also have a cleaner representation within your database where, hey, I can look at my list of users and then I can also look at their list of orders and, you know, do a join to see, hey, what users are making which orders. But having them separate uh, and only stored once means that you don't need to have like two duplicate tables. Um, and you don't have a bunch of duplicate data stored because, you know, you want to store all these different uh, users' orders. Or because, you know, things like a user might be making multiple orders and if you're storing all their user information alongside every order, there's just a ton of duplicate data that's being fed in there. Now, the next tip I have on the data normalization side of things is to actually denormalize for read heavy applications. So if you have an application where you just need to constantly read this data and it's actually more efficient to have the users and orders together, you can have a denormalized table that will combine those previously normalized tables to reduce the need for joins when you're trying to query, you know, the subset of data that joins orders and users together, which will vastly improve your performance for read heavy applications. But as I said before, this is going to introduce a lot of redundancy and potential data anomalies where you're just going to have like for every order, you're going to have all that user information rather than just the order information, a simple user ID to go reference for all of that information about that user. However, if most of your queries are querying user ID and uh, their order information at the same time, you're going to make a lot of joins to actually be able to do that. And this structure will reduce the need for joins when you're querying that user order data and speed up read op applications for, you know, for read operations. So now breaking out of the schema normalization side of things, I want to just round off this video with a couple tips for monitoring and analyzing your query performance. So one useful tool that a lot of people don't know about is the explain statement. And so this explain statement will show how the database plans to execute a query and give you insights into which indexes are joined, are used, join order, estimated cost of different operations. And this can help you identify bottlenecks in areas for optimization within your database. So if you just use, add this, you know, explain to the beginning of really any query, this will then give you an output that guides you on whether indexes are being used or if there's any potential inefficiencies in that query plan. And another tool you can use to monitor and you know, analyze your query performance is query profiling tools. So this will be different for every database, but for you know, MySQL database, um, these will offer detailed insights into query execution times, resource usage, and other metrics. Um, and so what you would do is do something like set profiling equals to one, which set equals to true, run that query, and then show the profile to see the execution time of the query and any performance issues as well. So just kind of two flavors of how you can analyze and, and monitor your queries for maximum performance. That's all I have for you today. I hope you've enjoyed this video on optimizing your SQL queries and hope you have a great rest of your day. Data guy out.